All right, guys. Well, welcome um, to our first hybrid chalk talk of 2021. Uh, we've been virtual for our chalk talks for the last two years. So it's good to see at least a few faces in person. And welcome to everyone who's joining us online. I'm Sheila Judge. I'm Senior Director for the Chemistry of Life Processes Institute. And our chalk talks have been a tradition since we moved into Silverman Hall in uh, winter of 2009-2010. Uh, and the goal has always been to help bring people uh, together across disciplines and stimulate collaboration. Uh, so we have a few housekeeping messages for you today. Uh, if you're on Zoom, to please mute yourself and uh, you know, please pay attention if you're in the chat to uh, you know raise your hand if you need something addressed, um, and let us know if you're experiencing any difficulties with uh, sound or visuals. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's my pleasure to introduce Eric Anderson, who is a, an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Biosciences. Eric earned his bachelor's in biological sciences at Stanford and his PhD at MIT, where he was an Anna Fuller Cancer Research Fellow. At that time, he studied developmental genetics of chromatin modulation in C. elegans under um, Bob Horvitz. Uh, as a uh, NIH and HHMI postdoctoral fellow with Leonid uh, Kroglak at Princeton, his research interests shifted to quantitative genetics and genomics. He came to Northwestern as an assistant professor in 2013 and joined CLP not long after. And he subsequently became a resident of Silverman Hall in 2018. So if you wanna see him, his space, he's up on uh, Four East in Silverman. His research group addresses a fundamental question in genetics, which is, how do our genes make us different from each other? And I'm going to, you, you've got some nice things written about that, but I'm going to let you tell us all about it. But I do want to note that um, Dr. Anderson, had, had his work has been recognized in many different venues as a Pew Biomedical Scholar, an NSF Career Recipient, an ACS Research Scholar, a Human Frontier Science Program uh, grantee, and a March of Dimes Basil O'Connor awardee. So Eric, thank you so much for making time to do this today. I'm looking forward, as is everyone else, to hearing your talk. And we are recording the talk for those who aren't going to be able to join us at this time. Take it away. Thank you, Sheila. Can you hear that? That sounds good. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and, and thank you to all of you online. So I'm going to try to watch the chat while I'm talking. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but we're here in person. And honestly, chalk talks are only funny or only fun. They should be funny too, um, but they're only fun if you interrupt me and ask questions uh, and, and really make this work. So uh, feel free to do so. Again, I'll watch the chat, but people in the room uh, just interrupt me, yell out, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, as, as, as Sheila said, my lab's interested in uh, the genetics and genomics of complex traits or what makes us different from each other. Uh, and what I wanted to talk about today is kind of go through the background of what my lab does, a little bit about the structure for how we answer our types of questions, again, with, with uh, feedback and, and questions from all of you. And then I will end up with a little bit of a story for something we published a few years back, just showing how you can use individual differences across populations to understand how drugs work in different ways. But the major takeaway is that in this building, right, we have many productive enterprises to identify new compounds and pharmaceuticals to be able to affect human health. They're all not gonna work on every person the same way. So uh, what my lab interest is to use individual differences in our drug responses to understand more about how these pharmaceuticals work so that we can design them to be able to work on larger swaths of the human population. So uh, to start there, right, we, we, we know just looking around the room, we all look different from each other, we act different from each other, we respond differently to drugs. So let's, let's just go with some uh, you know, different colored people here and I'm gonna, 
my, my artwork is also horrendous, so we'll, we'll, we'll do as best I can. I'll see if you can see this on the screen. Can you zoom in a little bit, Lisa, please? Thank you. Um, so let's say we've got four different people, and you can tell they're different people because they're different colors. Um, and these different people are all going to uh, be exposed or they're going to take a particular drug or pharmaceutical or exposed to some toxin in the environment, whatever it might be. So let's say that it's an actual drug. This is a pill. Um, we're all going to take this particular compound and these people are going to respond differently from one another. So if we think about a, a basic plot where we're going to have our response to this particular drug and I'm sorry, we have, I'm already screwing up in the first thing. With like a prelim. Okay, so we have a response to a particular drug. And here we just have the count of the number of people that will respond in a particular way. So let's say, let's say we don't have just have four people. I'll draw an example of these four, but let's say we have hundreds or thousands of people. Typically for most drug responses across a population, we're gonna have something that looks like a normal distribution of responses. So let's say this individual here is gonna be a low responder to the drug, whereas this individual here is gonna be a high responder to the drug. And the, most people are going to be somewhere in the middle of this distribution where they're going, to, they're going to respond relatively similarly to each other, but we're going to have sensitive and resistant individuals to particular compounds um, across, across our population. So this type of response, is, it comes from our genetics, the differences that we all have with each other, but it also comes from environmental differences we have across our exposure to the compound, the food we ate that particular day, the temperature in the room, who knows, right? The phase of the moon. There are lots of things that can influence the ultimate phenotype or the ultimate response we have to this drug. But what we care about as geneticists and genomicists are the genes that lead to these differences. So for genetic differences in a population, um, genetic differences, we're gonna be thinking about differences in targets for a particular compound. So oftentimes what this means is gonna be some type of protein coding or some type of amino acid. Um, change in, uh, in a sequence that's going to lead to the response to this drug. So maybe the drug uh, interacts with a particular part of a, of a molecule of, of a protein. And if we have an amino acid change, it can't interact as well as it did before. We're going to get a difference in response. Um, we also are going to have some type of differences in the, the levels of a target oftentimes. So in this case, it's going to be gene expression differences. So maybe it's not altering, altering the protein sequence, but it's altering the levels of expression of a particular target. So a high responder might just have a lot more of a target than a low responder, let's say. Uh, and then of course, we're gonna have lots of differences in the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of a particular uh, compound exposed to. So this is gonna come into kind of uh, import into the cell, uh, export by different types of mechanisms, degradation of that particular compound and so on. And there are many, many genes that contribute these types of responses uh, to, to compounds. And these are where genetic differences in the population will often be found. So we might have individuals that the drug does not bind as well, or there's more or, fewer or less of the particular protein that's targeting, or as soon as that compound gets into the cell, it's being degraded at a different rate. And these are the types of things in which uh, in our population, we're gonna vary. And they come from the processes of evolution that, that lead to these differences. So what that means is that all of these particular levels of the effect that we see of genetic differences are gonna be coming from some type of selection in a population, or they're gonna be drift, drifting in a population, which is just random chance differences across a group of individuals. And the difference between selection or drift is gonna likely come down to whether we as humans have experienced this long in the past. There's been enough time to have some type of genetic difference that's inherited across a population. Uh, and in the case of drift, it's likely, it's not under any type of selection. There just are random differences across our population. Some of them might lie in some of these factors and that will lead to differences in the drug response. So my lab's interested in understanding the differences between selection and drift for different types of, of drug responses. I'm not gonna go deeply into that today. The major things here are how do we use the resources we have to understand and identify the genetic differences across populations. Uh, okay, no questions, good. So, yeah, please. So, the, top, the first two mechanisms of drug specific, and the third mechanism of drug generic, are examples of sort of broad mechanisms with respect to responses to many, many drugs, or are they? 
at these levels? Not a oh, these. The export, but maybe the transporter, for example. Yep. The expression level of them looks like 50. The difference between the different individuals, which would then generically make them less sensitive to the ocean. Uh -huh. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there, there are genetic differences in, in ABC transpores being one of them for which we, we've seen that there are expression differences in the ABC transpores that lead to differences in how much a drug gets into a particular cell or tissue. That happens. Um, these can also have specific aspects to them as well. So there are, so with ABC transporters, yes, a lot of them have broad specificity, but some of them have more narrow specificities. And depending upon the drug class, right, you see some of these, uh, they're, they're going to be more general than this, but they can be they can be relatively specific to certain types of toxicants, let's say, where uh, you know copper stress comes out of a particular way with a particular suite of genes that affect copper stress. Um, but yeah, does that make sure. sense? Yeah. And, and, and am I correct that the third class is the only class that's broad in terms of the expression? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that that so in this case I'm talking about the target specifically so by the definition of how I've divided the world that's 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 right. <laughs> um, but there are many common pharmaceuticals that we use all the time that uh, do not often have variation in these targets, because those targets are necessary processes that if you were to eliminate function you'd make pretty sick people. Um, and oftentimes the variation we see is in the level of, uh, of, of generalized effects to that compound. Ah, yes, I will. I, I, I apologize. So um, Dr. Brickner uh, was asking whether, uh, whether there is specificity in the types of um, interactions between the drug and the ultimate effect of that drug when we look at the genetic differences across populations. So um, at the level of import, export, and degradation, are there examples where uh, there's variation in a process for which it can be not specific to a particular compound or we have general responses to that compound? Yes, there is. Yeah. So, so uh, what Sheila just said is that um, we have uh, uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Uh, there are differences in that function within the liver that can lead to differences in the metabolic state of the liver cells and therefore their responsiveness to particular compounds. That's absolutely true. There are 150 drugs currently on the market that have a required genetic test that goes along with the um, when you go to the doctor and you get prescribed that particular compound, and it's for these exact reasons, and most of them come down to this this broad uh, these broad class specifications. So they they want to make sure you don't have interactions with other drugs that you're taking, and they also don't have interactions with genetic differences in your absorption rates or degradation rates. Good. Okay. Um, so. Uh, so the major thing here is that there are differences across populations of individuals. What is a population was an individual. So typically when we're doing uh, drug design, we're often taking uh, model organisms for which we can characterize that response, be that you know, a, a, a fly, a worm, a yeast, a mouse. Um, we're taking cell lines in many cases because those cell lines, we can easily create reporters to be able to look at the response of our particular compound to that, uh, uh, to that particular molecular pathway, whatever it might be. Um, and then we'll often move up into larger you know, dogs for pharmacokinetics and dynamics and so on, or humans, if we want to look at the responses. But even a lot of the drugs that are made today are often used in their testing on a very small subset of the human population. So typically Caucasians, Europeans are the ones for which we test a lot of things. Um, and that leads to differences in responses to these drugs when we go to the broad general population. So uh, one of our goals here is to understand more about that process and to be able to uh, to find the genes that can vary in our responses to compounds. Okay, so to get there, we need to find the genes. So we need to find the genes that are responsible for these differences uh, in uh, uh, drug responses across the population. So I uh, am going to argue that doing this within humans, although the pharmaceutical industry is now spending a large amount of money to be able to look across diverse populations to be able to do this, 
But even in those cases, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to be able to identify the genes that lead to these responses. If there are single genes that have the effect, then we've often found them. So again, we have 150 drugs for which we've done exactly that. Um, but when it gets more complex than that, it's hard to find them in the human population. So um, what we use in my lab is uh, the round worm nematode that I, you know, despite working on them for 20 years, still can't really draw. Um, but I work on the, the round worm nematode C. elegans. And C. elegans is this great model. We know every single cell, when it's born, what it turns into. We know all the different genes in the organism. It was the first metazoan genome to be complete from telomere to telomere. We, we know a ton about this particular, every neuron, every one of 300 neurons, we know where they connect. It's all wonderful and a very useful, powerful model, but it all came from the study of a single individual in the species that was found in Bristol, England back in 1951. So to be able to make this connection between differences across a population, we can't just look at one worm in our population to be able to understand uh, how they're different from each other. So I'm going to erase this unless anyone has particular questions or issues online. Nope, we don't either. Okay, so maybe I'll leave that. Sure. Should never erase side to side, I need to. Okay. So what we're doing to be able to identify these genetic differences across populations is ultimately we are comparing um, genetic differences, so differences in our genes, and we are correlating those with, in this case, let's say drug response differences. And we, when we can identify a correlation between a genetic difference and a drug response difference, that will tell us that we've identified one of these genetic factors that's leading to that, uh, that difference in response. Okay. So to do this, I'm gonna go through kind of each half of this, uh, of this equation here, or I should say this relationship uh, to be able to tell you what we do. Um, so on the genetic differences side of things, I'm, I'm happy to kind of go through the nitty gritty of all this, but um, what my lab does is we, we, we don't wanna study one particular strain within the species. So our friends and collaborators and colleagues have gone out and collected over the last uh, nine years that I've been here, we started with 100, we're now at the 1600 different strains that are found all around the world. So we've got, you know, in humans, yes, we have millions, billions of people involved. Um, we have 1600 different strains of these. They're genetically about 500, 540 or about 600 of these are genetically unique individuals across the population. If we look at humans, we've got about 10 to 20,000 genetically unique individuals across the population by, by the same kind of metrics that I'm discussing here. So we don't have as many individuals within worms, but the good thing is that we can control many aspects of how we do these experiments so that we don't need as many people to be able to do these types of, uh, this type of relationship. So we've got 1,600 different strains. Um, all of these come to my lab um, where we do some whole genome sequencing and we take these whole genome sequence data and we identify every position across that genome where there is a change in the genome. So at this point, we're now up to about 4.4 million um, single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms or changes in the genome and about a million of these where we've also identified a very small deletion or addition of a piece of DNA. So those are called indels for insertion deletion changes. Um, and why does this matter? This essentially, we can take all of these data for these 4.4 million SNPs or these 1 million indels. I told you every gene in the C. elegans genome, we know where it is, where it's expressed, all that. So we can look at all these and say, how many of them fall within genes? And of those that fall within genes, how would they affect a particular amino acid, the levels of expression, whatever we can predict about the effect of these variants on, uh, uh, on the gene function. So essentially, this just gives us uh, essentially a parts list for variation across the species of C. elegans that when we're doing this correlation, we can go back to and say, what is it exactly that uh, has changed in those individuals? And can we relate that to our drug response? And I should say C. elegans is one of those species for which CRISPR genome editing is easy. It's the kind of thing we can do all the time. So once you have this parts list and you want to test for a causal relationship, between 
your change and your drug response difference, it's it's relatively in the course of a few weeks easy for us to do that. Please. Like, what is the model for the variation? Yeah. Um, I, I am not, but thank you for asking. It's a good question. So, so uh, the question is, what's the homology or the level of similarity we would see between these variants uh, we identify in C. elegans and what we see across the human population? And the short answer is at the level of variation in any population, C. elegans included in that, it's going to be distinct from what we see in humans. But kind of taking the lens back a little bit and thinking about this. So of the 20,000 genes we have in C. elegans, 65 to 70% of them have direct orthologs that we can identify in the human genome. If we take all of those genes, we can essentially say how many of these orthologous genes in C. elegans have variation in them. That variation is oftentimes different. The example I'm going to go through is actually one where we're, it's, it's similar or the same, um, but, but if we get there, uh, remind me again, and I'll, 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 I'll go through that part of the story. But um, in population genetics, you oftentimes don't expect to find the exact same, oh. Okay, emergency averted. <laughs> so uh, um, in population genetics, because every species has its own evolutionary trajectory, they, every species accumulates its own set of unique changes to its genome. Many times they, they can be affecting orthologous genes, right? So it might be broken in humans and broken in worms, but they're gonna be broken in different ways. So we can still use this as a parts list to get to those kind of homologous or orthologous gene relationships, but um, I don't wanna stand here at all and ever say that the variation we see in humans is gonna be the same as what we see in worms. And that's the short answer to your question. Um, the slightly longer answer I will skip, but just to say that selection across populations is also different. Humans have gone through a massive expansion within a relatively short period of evolutionary time, which means we are all collections of rare mutations mostly. That's what makes us different from each other. Worms are, are not that way. Drosophila, mice, yeast, they're not that way. So the types of variation is also different, but that I can dig into that a little bit differently later if we want. Is that good? Okay. Um, okay, so, so this is where we are. We've got this parts list on the genotype side of things. Um, I am not using my standing so you can all see the, well, okay. Let me know if you can't see anything, people online. It looks like you're okay. Um, so that's this side of the equation or this side of the relationship. On the drug response differences, uh, we've got a bunch of worms. Obviously, they're not people. They don't have arms and legs. They don't do all the kind of same things that we do. Um, but we can still measure different attributes in those worms or traits in those worms that can tell us about drug responses. Um, so in my lab, what we have done is built a series of different high throughput pipelines that allow us to measure drug responses specifically uh, in, in many different ways that the worm can, and from what's been seen in the past, the worms respond to, to drugs. So, and quantitatively get a difference in those. So what do I mean? So, um, one of the effects that we often have when we have a drug is that you get a um, reduction in offspring production. Uh, um, we also will see sometimes a reduction in growth. We see a reduction in feeding. Um, we'll also see death but I'm also gonna put in the side of things paralysis because what is death? Uh, it's a long, difficult thing. And for a worm or a yeast uh, or even a human, if we wanna debate what is actually death in a human, um, there, there are different ways to interpret it. So for a worm, um, uh, we're, we're gonna count paralysis as death, as unrecoverable death uh, when they don't come out of a paralysis state. So these four different traits or four different ways that uh, a worm can respond to a drug effect we've built a series of assays to be able to measure that for, for again, hundreds to thousands of individuals and to quantitatively, and, and to do a large number of replicates to quantitatively measure differences across this population. Um, so uh, in, in super short outline form, because I don't want to talk too long about all these things, um, we have built a, an assay that takes advantage of a flow-based device that we call the sorter. Um, for those who do cell assays, it's like a fax machine, but for worms, this allows us to be able to measure offspring production. For growth, um, we have a new high throughput imaging platform that allows us to take pictures of hundreds of 96 well plates a day and to 
quantify the lengths of worms because uh, worms get longer as they get older. So if we look at a drug that reduces growth, those worms are gonna be shorter. So we wanna quantitatively measure differences in length. We can do that with this imager. Um, for, uh, for feeding rate, we can also use our sorting device here. So worms eat bacteria. They'll also eat uh, fluorescent microspheres that are the same size as bacteria. So we can just run them through our sorter and see who's more red than somebody else for how much they've eaten within a period of time. So we can see when feeding rates are affected. And then we also have a, um, I'm just gonna call it a laser. Um, we've got a 96 well laser device that allows us to be able to measure worms swimming quantitatively in liquid. And that can tell us when uh, animals are paralyzed or paralyzed for a long period of time, which we call death. Um, and, uh, and this allows us to quantitatively measure the response to, uh, to, that, to, to compounds in that way. So we've got these different platforms that allow us to measure different aspects of drug response in worms. And, uh, and again, we've got this parts list of all these differences. So in a perfect world, all we have to do is get all of our different worm strains, expose them to compounds at the same concentration or a series of concentrations and measure these responses and then find the genes that lead to those differences. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, and there's a question. We may be going there, but given the advent of polygenic risk scores for various health outcomes, is there an analog for pharma polypharmacogenomic made up, it's a made up word, uh, or risk response? Okay, so um, Jason, great question. So uh, let's see. So polygenic risk scores for everyone in <laughs> paying attention at home, and, and Jason's clearly an expert on these things, um, uh, are, are a way of taking a genome sequence and the variants that you've identified in that sequence and, uh, and correlating that with differences in, again, some type of drug response or some type of phenotype across a population. And then if you find people who have similar sets of variants, you can make a prediction about whether that person should share the set of traits or phenotypes that the, the previously identified person has. And, um, it, it's a, uh, it, is, it is the most popular thing to do now in human genetics. It has uh, both positives and negatives, which I'm not deeply gonna go into, um, but Jason answered your question about worms. No, we don't build um, polygenic risk scores. Uh, we can, uh, we, we typically use um, what's called NeuroSense heritability, which are, you probably know because you're asking this question, but it's the additive effects of genes across a population. Um, so, and I'm happy to go into and answer your question more deeply in a bit, but that's, uh, that's the most, the short answer is we don't do it typically just because uh, it doesn't work the same way within worms as it does in humans, the population's different. Um, okay, sorry, I digress. Um, so, so we have uh, these uh, traits that we measure and we have genetic differences across a population. So let's just make a pretend example here where we've got, again, some response. And we have measured that response from, uh, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight individuals across a population. So some individuals are low responders, some individuals are high responders across a population. And what we want to do is identify these genes. So we have to know what part of the genome and how to find these things. So we will take that same response distribution that you see here, and we'll look at the genome and divide it up by every position in the genome where we have these differences. So at, let's say one position in the genome, we've got a, uh, an A and another position we have a gene, a G, uh, and we will look to see if the individuals that have the A allele um, are, uh, have a different phenotype than the individuals that have the G allele in this population. And let's see if I make my dots at the right spots. Um, so, and then we do a statistical test to say, are the A individuals different than the G individuals across a population? And in that case, this statistical test would say, no, they are not different from each other across the population. So whatever genes are nearby this, this particular AG, which let's just call marker, marker number one, um, is, uh, is not causing this difference in our drug response. Whereas by contrast, if we go to another position in the genome, um, at that position, we might find that there is a, a, a T and a C uh, variant change. And in that case, let's say we've got uh, all the individuals that have the T have a lower trait difference than all the individuals that have the C at that position. Uh, and again, we do that statistical test and we're very excited now because those individuals that have a difference at this particular position 
are informative for whether there's a drug response difference. So we can look at the genes nearby this, this, this marker number two, ugh, marker two, um, and see if any of those genes are involved in this response. We can go and CRISPR them, we can test them and so on. So this is what we do across our populations, um, but we don't just do it for two markers. We typically do this for um, about 50,000 markers across the genome. So here are our markers. And then again, that statistical test that I told you about, we're looking for whether there's a difference in distribution as we split by these two different markers. So this is gonna be our statistical test output. And the higher it is, the more statistically likely it is. So we typically get many different points for which there is no relationship, just like we see at marker one, but then we might find some part of the genome for which there is a relationship. And at this part of the genome here, we will go and look for that particular uh, gene of interest. Uh, and we've, we've taken this, this whole process I've described here and automated many of these aspects so we can identify a large number of those positions. Any, yeah, any questions? Yeah, Jason. So, <laughs> maybe it's just a question, but I, I feel like there's a single frame of data from the experiment into one very dominant uh-huh at the outset that wouldn't necessarily be predicted right you might get might have lots of cases where there are 50 sites in the genome that get each incrementally distributed you can get every possible uh this whole range of uh -huh. is it possible to find all 50 genes all 50 contributors in that state or is it only is it harder to do that and you need more statistical power than if you have a single yeah. So, so what, uh, what Jason, yep, uh, yep, I'll request you. So, what Jason has asked is the example I just drew here. I drew a single position for which we had identified a relationship between genotype, or sorry, between a genetic difference and a drug response difference. And, uh, and Jason was asking typically what I show and what a lot of other people show who work on quantitative genetics are these types of examples. And is that the case that they're simple like this, or are there many different loci that are contributing to it? And uh, the short answer is a lot of us, to, including me, talk about these types of things because these are the easy ones for us to find and we find them. Um, given the number of individuals we typically would do in the lab, these, this situation is, is the easiest thing to find. Uh, but there are numerous examples from, from my lab and other labs where I'm drawing it simply this way, but we, we definitely have many different loci across the genome. If we go to yeast, your favorite organism, and do this same type of experiment, they typically look at 10 to 15,000 individuals. So not 1,600, but you know, tens of thousands of individuals. There's actually a paper on BioArchive from three weeks ago now that looked at 150,000 individuals. And they're finding hundreds of loci throughout the genome. And they're able to identify exactly down to the specific gene for each of the 100 loci, hundreds of loci, because they have such high statistical power. So the major way to think about this, this one single peak I'm drawing here is that this part of the genome right here it underlies a significant portion of this relationship between genotype and the drug response difference. Oftentimes, even in the best cases in my lab, let's say, it would only be 30, 40% of the difference across the population. So this, this again, is our difference across the population. So this locus might only explain 40%, let's think about it that way, 40% of the difference that we might see in, uh, in a drug response. If we were to turn down statistical significance or add on a whole lot more individuals, we're gonna find additional loci and those loci will be contributing less than that 30 or 40% of the statistical variation. Oh. Oh, I answered that one. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So a related question, so let's imagine you have Mm -hmm. Is it possible from just knowing that you know, you can build a model for how those two books have interact or mm -hmm. the way, or are they work independently? Like yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, what Jason asks is that let's say we've got two different loci. Um, can we use that information to be able to build a model for how those two loci are contributing to uh, our, our drug response difference? Because in this plot I'm showing you here with this relationship, it's agnostic to the level and the direction, sorry, not to the level, it's agnostic to the direction of the effect 
that we've identified. So um, yes, there are, uh, uh, I was working on a paper last night. There, there are many cases in which we've identified, let's say multiple loci, but you can take two of them. One of them might make individuals uh, more responsive and the other one makes individuals less responsive. So we have uh, enough individuals in our population. And, in, and again, in yeast, this is done many, many times over where you've got enough examples of, of, of let's say the high of, of the high of one and the low of the other, and then high of both, low of both, and the reciprocal so that you're able to separate into four groups of individuals and do a statistical test to see if those four groups can contribute to the, the trait difference. Uh, absolutely, yeah, there's a, see a decade ago now, yeah, there's a beautiful paper in yeast um, kind of going through this type of interaction for, um, for sporulation. Um, and it's kind of one of our classic examples in quantitative genetics for how you can pick apart these types of responses. Um, and we have responses in worms where specifically in drug responses where we've identified the target where the drug is hitting uh, a particular gene, we find the gene, but then we find other loci that are now hitting other parts of this response. So they're more generalizable uh, and they are involved in, uh, in, in, in most of these cases in terms of degradation of that, of that drug within the cells. So it's the major effect is in the target, but more of minor effects have been in uh, these guys. Actually, I should say we, we also have other ones where the major effect is at this level and the minor effect is the target. Um, uh, a target expression in many cases. So uh, yeah, you can, you can absolutely pick them apart. So it really comes down to the number of individuals you have, because the more you have, the more statistical power you have so that this, you, you essentially are taking this, this noise threshold and you're moving it down and you're moving signal up, you'll find more loci. So every time that we've done an, a large experiment like this, since I've been here, we've done three big ones, they get bigger every time we do them. And for the, some of the same compounds we've mapped over and over, we're identifying more and more loci every time we do it um, and, and digging into more of that effect. Yep. Oh, another question. Oh, Dr. Gaber. Okay. Because these worms are diploid, when you assay the effect of, of an individual genetic variant, are using some manner of manipulation generating worms that are homozygous for the variants? Okay. So, so what Rick is asking is uh, worms are diploid. I've been talking about the power of yeast, and yeast are haploid, which makes life easy. Diploid means they've got two copies of every chromosome. The nice thing about C. elegans and the reason why I still work with them is that although they are diploid, these worms like to have sex with themselves. So they homozygous their genomes and they are effectively the same genotype or the same genome, even though they have two copies of that genome. So it's like, uh, these are the animals for which we can have a haploid equivalent of doing these types of, uh, these types of, uh, ex uh, these types of crosses. So, so yeah, so Rick, that's why I was saying, I don't really worry about it because they're effectively homozygous at all loci. And from our sequencing that we've done to characterize this, we absolutely see that's the case, that, that even worms we find directly from nature are mostly homozygous at all loci. Okay, good. How much time do I, I have no time left. Um, so do I keep going or how many? <laughs> this is good, these are good questions. Oh yeah, please. Yeah, so when I first started here, I kind of collected 80 different uh, drugs that, um, that were out there. So chemotherapeutics, um, anti-nematode compounds that are used for billions of people across the world. I also collected a sets of toxicants of different classes. So heavy metals, pesticides, uh, and others. And we've also done things with food and alcohol differences. Uh, that was early on. Since then, we've focused on collections, specific collections of anti-nematode or anthelmintic compounds, chemotherapeutics, and toxicants of different classes. Uh, and, but we're open to trying different things. So uh, Neil, uh, sorry, Dr. Keller, whatever, Neil and I are, are working on difference in some of the natural compound, natural products that he's identified from we're looking at those responses in worms to see if there are some new anthelmintic or new anti-nematode compounds that he's identified and how they might vary across uh, the worm population. So he runs them on human cells, sees if they don't have an effect on human cells, then we run them on worms because the goal is to kill the parasitic worms inside us and not the human cells. So, uh, but that's one of the examples. Uh, and with, uh, with some companies, my lab also collaborates to do the same thing to test new compounds for which they want to identify in many cases, the target, they don't know what the target is. This is just a compound that's been around for a while and it's very useful for its, for its, for its effects, but they want to know exactly 
what the target is or if there's any difference in, in kind of pharmacodynamics and, uh, and kinetics. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the humans. For going back to your original question. Yeah. So, so I'll try to summarize as best I can. So, so what we do is we will identify this particular gene. We'll CRISPR show it's the right gene in worms. If we feel good about that gene in worms, we then look to see if it's present in humans. Sometimes that exact gene is present in humans. Again, there's an ortholog in humans between worms and humans. In those cases, what we've done is we've gone to uh, CRISPR that particular variant that we've identified in worms or a variant that should be shared in the worm, uh, sorry, in the human population for that locus or a nearby locus. And then we expose them to the pharmaceutical, to the drug, to the toxicant, whatever it might be. And we look to see over the number of generations as those cell, those human cells continue to divide, whether we have a change in the susceptibility to that compound. So typically we try to take a cell line that's sensitive to a drug and we add on a variant by CRISPR that makes it resistant. And we look over time to see if that's the case. So for, for some chemotherapeutics, we've done this and we've identified in worms, the target of those chemotherapeutics and then gone to show that in human cells, that selectivity for the target uh, can vary. And that also we know varies within different tissues of humans. Uh, and we were able to, to make a connection between responsiveness for particular tissues and what, the, what individual humans might have. Um, that's one for, for arsenic responses is another example. In this case, we discovered a, a different mechanism that haven't, hasn't been identified in humans before. We edited human cells and showed that uh, it works in the same way in human cells as it does in worms. But the major effect in humans comes from, from here, from uh, degradation of arsenic or arsenite-like compounds. Whereas in worms, we're able to get to other targets because they don't have the same modification enzymes in worms as we do within humans. So there are, there are good and bad things. There are also probably another dozen stories I can tell you where we never made any connection to humans whatsoever, but that stuff still excites me because it tells us about evolution. It tells about how these drugs work. It tells us about populations. Um, but uh, in the kind of best examples we have those, we typically go to the human cell editing experiments next and look for these changes in frequencies in the edited populations. And I didn't repeat that question, but okay. I apologize everyone online. Um, good. All right. So Eric, yep. do you have uh, connections to collaboration with Neil's group of other collaborations with faculty of Boston Western? Are you looking for collaboration where your technology is applied? Yeah, absolutely. So so we're we're happy to talk and collaborate where our different High throughput techniques are useful for other labs. Um, people nearby that have heard about this, that that's typically where it happens. Um, we have uh, other collaborations, not on anything I've described here, but on, on um, other aspects of the statistics and math that I totally skipped over uh, with people at Northwestern. I'm also happy to talk about those things. Um, and we have collaborations um, dealing with some of the genomics and the evolutionary projects that I also totally skipped over. Um, that, uh, that, that my lab works on. So this is, this is one aspect of what my lab does, but we have, we have a variety of other projects that are pretty distinct from each other relating to ecology of worms within natural environments, uh, all the way to some structural studies that we're doing now on how uh, targets of drugs interact with, uh, with differences in their gene, their, their gene products like proteins. So, and I'm happy to talk about uh, other collaborations and ideas where C. elegans and these platforms could be useful to people. Rick. Thanks. Uh, so, if you have a drug Yeah, so 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 uh, what Rick's asking is if we if we if a company comes to us and wants to identify the the target and we use worms to identify that target, how many times can we relate that back to uh, the human target? So at this point, on the at least the industry company side of things, everything my lab's done has been helping out the pharmaceutical companies that make these anthelmintic or anti nematode compounds, where there is a very direct connection. Um, I. Uh, have yet to talk to uh, companies making uh, human-based pharmaceuticals to be able to do these things. 
at the end of the day, it's possible, but I think it's going to be a big risk, right? Worms are pretty distinct from humans. Uh, again, only 60, 65% of the genes are going to have any type of orthologous relationship where we can make that connection. That doesn't mean it's, uh, uh, it's not possible. It's just, uh, it's just going to be more of a question. So the, the positives I think on our side are that it's relatively cheap to do worm experiments and to do these high throughput assays. It's also relatively quick. Uh, we can get to tissue specificity and we can get to some of the physiological differences using our worms because they're, they're clear, easy to see and do microscopy. And they're again, uh, cheap and quick. So those are positives. On the negative side, it could easily be a biological process for which vertebrates have a, a unique way of doing this and, and worms don't have it at all. And there are, are numerous examples of this. Worms have no immune system. So anything where there's an immune regulation is not going to be the case, right? Worms have beautifully characterized nervous systems and those effects. And we know, again, all the neurons and their connections. But the way they make action potentials is different than what we see with invertebrates. So there are going to be differences. I think there are, in many cases, what we typically do with, the, with these uh, 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 anthelmintic companies when they come to us are just say, what are you thinking of? Don't tell me what your drug is and exactly what the targets are. But tell me a little bit more about how this was developed so we can think of a way where there might be overlap. With the worm stuff, I think it's easy. A parasitic nematode versus a free living nematode has a pretty easy connection. But for humans, we'd probably have to dig more deeply into what do they know about targets? What do you know about tissues they're affected? What are the pharmacodynamics and kinetics? And maybe then we can figure out a way to make it work. But, but it's not gonna be a slam dunk every time. I think that's, that you're, you're, you're totally right there. It doesn't always relate. <laughs> what? No, no, I have not. Um, yeah, I've been, I, so a, a while ago, I thought about a model for peripheral neuropathy and how you can look at the, the worm responses to, so worms respond to harsh touch and gentle touch in different ways. So um, it, it, essentially you got to take an eyelash and you have to rub the worm right below the pharynx to be able to see these differences. Um, and, and I couldn't figure out a way to make it high throughput enough to do the types of things that we do because no human wants to sit there and rub, you know, thousands of worms and look at those responses. So, um, but that was, that was one of the things that early on we, we played with when we started the lab to, to see about this. That's right. Yeah, so for chemotherapeutics, to, to, to repeat the question, we're doing exactly that. Yes, we are. And I think chemotherapeutics are a special type of situation. Most of them are developed based upon natural compounds that exist in settings. So they're made by bacteria and fungi and organisms for which C. elegans is also in those same environments. So going back to this evolutionary question about selection or drift, these are compounds where the worms have been responding to them for longer than we have because they're in this, this natural warfare that occurs in that environment. So a lot of the mechanisms that we've been able to get to I, they can relate and we've had some success there. Again, not every time, but we've had some success there because I think it's these, these similar selection regimes that have gone on long ago for metazoans interacting with these, these compounds made by bacteria and fungi. Yeah. That is exactly right. So, so the, the, the point brought up was that the validation experiments that we're doing in human cells that I very quickly glossed over, we're doing these in cell lines. So they're, they're in every case that we've done, they are immortalized cell lines. They're also easy to CRISPR, which is a whole other thing which we can talk about because not every cell line you can do these types of experiments. So the fact that they're easy to CRISPR means that they have already a different type of uh, uh, machinery get at play for how they deal with DNA damage and other aspects of what's going on inside those cells. So um, absolutely, uh, it is a, a it, it's it's a validation experiment for a worm guy, but in reality, is this is this cell line going to be recapitulated human response? I mean, it's going to be pretty far from that. Um, for the toxicant responses like arsenic and others that my lab works on, uh, it is in many cases very poorly defined what these, how these compounds, these toxicants even affect tissues and cells within humans. We know how they affect immortalized cell lines, like we can talk about that, uh, but we know nothing about the actual tissue effects.
Yeah, fantastic point. That's fantastic. So, so moving a variant from a worm, even if you might find an orthologous position to the same variant position in a human cell or human gene, sorry, is going to have a, potentially a different effect. Absolutely. So typically what we do is we do, we do knockouts because um, a lot of times this difference that we're characterizing comes down to a difference in gene function where one set of worms has lost that gene function and the other, or has a reduction in that gene function and the other set has a normal gene function. So we go to cell lines, it, it's, it's gonna be very difficult to find that exact residue, but knocking out the gene should recapitulate something about this reduction or loss of that gene's function. And that's the closest that we can get to doing the genetics in the same way in that, in that immortalized cancer cell line, which is, a, which is not a human in any way. Yeah, these, these are fantastic questions and points. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a worm guy, I'm, I am like, this is the best we can do. Um, but, uh, but we're excited that in some cases it's actually worked. Um, and, uh, and typically I think if we had to focus on everything we can do with the worms, that's why going the enthelmintics or discovery of new anti-nematode compounds is where I think we've had the most traction because they're much more closely related. Okay, good. Um, thank you everybody. Um, and thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you.